Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One. Just happen to have a copy of it here to show you, and I urge you to go to Amazon, pick one up. If you haven't already done so, you'll enjoy it. I promise. And I thank you in advance for doing so. Whether you're watching on our YouTube or FunkinStuff.net or Vimeo uh, broadcasts or listening to the podcasts, audio versions on iTunes and other leading providers, I thank you very much for your continued interest and support. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, subscribe. Subscribe to the Funkin Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. And tell friends, tell family we need that support and it is much appreciated. This episode features a giant of jazz, fusion, and funk drumming, Mr. Lenny White. His career got off to a spectacular start in his late teens when he followed in the footsteps of jazz drumming legends Tony Williams and Jack DeJohnette as part of Jackie McLean's band and then Miles Davis. While still a teen, White's first recording sessions wound up being Davis's landmark jazz fusion album, Bitches Brew. Talk about fast out of the gate. He then was also featured along with Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, and Joe Henderson on trumpeter Freddie Hubbard's highly uh, acclaimed Red Clay album. At the same time, in the early 1970s, he was working studio sessions with a who's who of the jazz world during that time, including Woody Shaw, Gil Evans, Gatto Barbieri, and even Santana. White's penchant for Latin flavored jazz rock took him to becoming a member of the famed fusion band Azteca, which was formed by the Escovito family and also included guitarist Neil Schoen, later of Journey, and bassist Paul Jackson, who would soon become a member of Hancock's Headhunters. White then joined the group for which he is best known, Return or Forever, the seminal groundbreaking jazz fusion band that also included Chick Corea, Stanley Clark, and Al Demiola. RTF toured the world and recorded touchstone albums while at the same time, its members produced solo albums. White debuted under his own name in 1975 with Venusian Summer and contributed to his bandmate Clark's 1970s albums, including the superlative School Days. RTF soon broke up and White continued to expand his playing, composing, and production horizons, both through his own albums and with others that included Jimmy Smith, Jaco Pastorius, Don Cherry, Farrell Sanders, the Brecker Brothers, and Steve Grossman. In the latter half of the 1970s, White unleashed a string of albums that included his band, 29, and focused more on vocals, funk, and R&B, but also included jazz and fusion elements. The formula brought him his first black radio hits with the funk songs, Peanut Butter and Kid Stuff. He also released a great update of the Beatles' Lady Madonna featuring Shaka Khan. He would go on to produce Khan, as well as Nancy Wilson, Diane Reeves, Rachel Farrell, and Marlena Shaw, among others, like Pieces of a Dream, Grover Washington, Wayne Shorter, and even rapper Big Daddy Kane. White teamed with Marcus Miller to score the music for the cult comedy classic House Party and also had a hand in the music for Spike Lee's School Days. In this in-depth interview, White goes deep on his start with Miles Davis and Freddie Hubbard, being part of the lauded Return to Forever, his solo albums and other key collaborations, the most unforgettable memories from his 50 year career and what he's been up to more recently, including lecturing at the Harvard Law School and Columbia University, hosting a podcast and putting together several recording projects. A central theme was that no matter what the style, keep the music authentic and move it forward. White continues to shine as a bright beacon of musical light upon us all. And without further ado, here he is. Enjoy. Hey, I'm thrilled to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Studio a legend of jazz, fusion, and funk drumming, as well as composition and production, none other than Lenny White. Lenny, how Sorry, are you today? I'm good, bro. I'm good. Great to see you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Now, where are you coming to us from today? Well, I'm actually on somewhat of a vacation in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Okay. Uh, I have a, a timeshare down here. So like uh, every uh, year I come down with the family. 
Oh, great. And what's what's home for you nowadays? Uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, actually. Okay, not too far. Yeah, mm -hmm. about yeah. six hours from here. Yeah. Very good. All right, well, as I, I told you before we started rolling, but I want the viewers and listeners to know, big fan going back to, uh, you know, the 70s uh, fusion heyday and uh, followed you ever since uh, through the funk, through the R&B, through the going back to the roots and all the good stuff. So great to have you. Thanks, man. So Lenny, how did you end up being a drummer? You know, how did you get to drums? What attracted you? And uh, tell us how you got started. Quite honestly, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't remember what made me gravitate to drums. I wanted to play trumpet. And uh, when I went to, to uh, junior high school uh, and I wanted to be in music, I wanted to be in, in the band, uh, they said that in order for you to play drums, you have to have had two years experience. And so they gave me a tuba. And I said, no, I'm not down with the tuba. So I lied and told them that I had two years experience. And actually, there's another drummer. And he said, don't worry about it. I mean, I, I'll help you through in terms of reading the musical. I'm mean, reading music. And uh, that's what happened, you know. And I, I kind of really gravitated to playing the drums. And uh, it seemed as though I had a good way to express myself. And so I continued on. And that's where I am. I'm continuing. <laughs> so about how old were you when that happened? Uh, this was junior high school. So I was like uh, 13, 12, 13. Yeah. And did you come from a musical household or family or? Yes, they were not musicians, but very musical. Like they played records all the time. And like every Sunday, my cousins and uncles would get together and they would come to our house because we had the great record player. And the grown ups would listen to, you know, jazz. They'd listen to what they call sides at the time, you know, vinyl records. And they would debate who was cleaner, Charlie Parker or Sonny Stitt. And they'd say, they'd talk about, you know, uh, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Lester Young, you know, Miles Davis, John Coltrane. And so I was around it all the time. And some of our my, some of my dad's friends who were musicians. And so like, you know, they would come over and they, you know, talk, eat food and talk. And so like, I got it that way. And every Sunday, that's what would happen, you know? And when you started really getting into drums yourself, who are some of your major influences? Well, in the beginning, you know, as as a kid, I was listening to R and B radio, R and B radio, R and B radio, and pop radio. And in terms of the music that my dad played in the house, you know, he played Duke Ellington, Count Basie. So you know, there was uh, Sam Woodyard and uh, uh, um, Louis Belson, uh, Sonny Greer, you know. And then Horace Silver. Mm -hmm. So the drummers that played with them, uh, I mean, like it was Lewis Hayes that played with uh, Horace Silver at the time. And there was uh, Joe Morello that played with uh, um, Dave Brubeck. Uh, and then I started to branch out and listen to a lot of other kinds of things. I listened to Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and Sly um, and of course James Brown. So uh, I started listening to a lot of different kinds of things and was influenced by a lot of different kinds of music. But then for me, my foundation was the Magnificent Seven. The Magnificent Seven are 
the seven jazz drummers for me that developed modern jazz drumming. And they are Art Blakey, Max Roach, Philly Joe Jones, Elvin Jones, Roy Haynes, Tony Williams, and Kenny Clark. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've heard of all of them, but I never heard them collectively referred to as the Magnificent Seven. Yeah. And, you know, there's John Bonham there, too. Cozy Powell. Um, and um, I listened a lot to Latin music. And Nicky Morero was the uh, timbali player that played with um, Eddie Palmieri. And uh, so, I, you know, I'm pretty well versed. Of course, Jabo Starks and uh, Clyde Stubberfield. Mm -hmm. Gregor Rico. Uh, you know, and I became really good friends with, with Mike Shreve, too, with Santana. So when you first started getting out into bands on your own, were you playing jazz or were you playing covers of those other people you mentioned or what kind of repertoire were you doing early on? Well, when I was actually going out and playing, there was a, a great piano player from Hampton, Virginia by the name of Weldon Irvine who migrated to Jamaica, Queens. And he became somewhat of a mentor to all of the young musicians in Jamaica, Queens. That included Billy Cobham and included Marcus Miller, Omar Hakeem, Donald Blackman, um, Bernard Wright, and myself. And so when we would play with Weldon, we'd play all kinds of music. And if I was to be in a wedding band, I had to play all different kinds of music. Yeah. So I was playing everything. Of course, jazz was my primary objective to be able to, 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 to play it and play with the masters. But I had to play all kinds of music. My, one of my first gigs with Weldon was with Millie Jackson. Yeah. And uh, I learned the hard way <laughs> about, you know, playing the funk with Millie Jackson. And so, you know, there were, there were different circumstances. Matter of fact, how Steve Grossman got into Miles Davis's band is I had done Bitches Brew with Miles and I went over to his house and I played him a cassette of a wedding reception that I did with George Cables on piano, Clint Houston on bass and Steve Grossman on saxophone. And we were playing James Brown's Lickin' Stick. And he heard that and said, who's the saxophone player? I said, that's my friend, Steve Grossman. He said, give me his number. Next thing I know, he was on the Jack Johnson record. Wow. He must so have been played, indebted I played to all kinds. Right. I played all kinds of music. I mean, you know, the whole thing for us was to be authentic. If you were going to play funky music, you had to be funky. If you were going to play reggae music, you had to have that reggae tilt. If you're going to play jazz, you had to swing. And coming up in Jamaica, from coming up in Jamaica Queens, we prided ourselves on being authentic with whatever kind of music we were supposed to play. Jamaica Queens is such a hotbed for musicians and especially jazz and R&B. Why do you think that particular area just brought so many great musicians for it? There were a lot of theories about it. I, you know, I really don't really adhere to any of the actual theories. But you know, sometimes what happens is people migrate to certain areas, and you know, like there's this camaraderie between the musicians of those areas. And there's a particular style. The thing about Jamaica Queens is like, in terms of Minneapolis, there's a Minneapolis sound, yeah, LA sound. But Jamaica Queens, what was different about that is we, because we played all different kinds of musics, there was a thing about the Jamaica Cats, but it transfixed 
and went through all the different kinds of music. There wasn't like a little thing that happened because it was Jamaica. We played it a certain way. We played all kinds of musics that had this particular vibe. I mean, you know, Minneapolis, there's like a Minneapolis sound. But with Jamaica, Queens, there are so many musicians from the area that have excelled in different kinds and different genres of music. So, I mean, like they, they really excelled with jazz, excelled with funk, excelled with a lot of different pop, a lot of different kinds of music. So I think it was just the attitude, man. You know, we had an attitude in Jamaica, Queens, where we really had to represent. We had to represent whatever kind of music it was. It wasn't that like, okay, the, the, the funk guys, it's just the funk guys. No, the funk guys had to be able to play reggae music. The funk guys had to be able to swing also. The swing guys had to be able to play funky music too. I think I think that's what was unique about Jamaica Queens is that like when we played whatever it is we played, it was authentic. Well, of course, you mentioned um, Bitches Brew, Miles. So, you know, how did you make that connection and how did you get to be part of, you know, one of the landmark recordings of all time? At 17 years old, a friend of mine played me a record. And the record was Seven Steps to Heaven. And when I heard the record, it was mind boggling to me. And I looked on the back of the album and the drummer was Tony Williams, who was 17 years old when he made the record. I was 17 years old. Immediately, he became my guy. I said, he's 17. I have to be able to do that. And my goal at 17 was to play with Miles Davis. Two years later, at 19, I got that opportunity to play with Miles Davis. The fact is, what well, it was, you know, New York was kind of like the wild, wild west. And if you were the, the young drum slinger at the time, everybody would want to check you out. And you had to be able to represent. So I had gotten an opportunity to play with Jackie McLean great saxophonist Jackie McLean. And I was young, that was 17, 18 years old. The fact is, Tony Williams at 17 had played with Jackie McLean. And then he went on to play with Miles Davis. Jack DeJanet played with Jackie McLean. Then he went on to play with Miles Davis. So when I played with Jackie McLean, everybody said, man, you're gonna play with Miles Davis. You're gonna play with Miles Davis. And sure enough, two years later, that's what happened. <laughs> wow. Like footsteps. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, if you really want something, you kind of surround yourself with with trying to have opportunities to do that, to do that. That's in your mindset. It's in your consciousness. It's in your your universe. And I was obsessed to play with Miles Davis. And I got the opportunity. During those sessions, were you like, wow, this stuff is out there? Or did it? Beer in headlights, man. That was my first record. Are you kidding? And, you know, like, these are guys that I had heard on other albums that I'm playing with. And, you know, this is Miles Davis. This is my mentor. This is Miles Davis. This is, <clears throat> I mean, there was John Coltrane, Jimi Hendrix, Miles Davis, you know, in the hood, these are the people that you wanted to aspire to play with. And so I didn't just get an opportunity to meet Miles Davis. I got an opportunity to play with Miles Davis. And this was really very, very, very special for me. We recorded that record. Actually, you know what's so deep is that in August this year, it'll be 50 years ago. Incredible. You know, isn't that deep, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but like we recorded in August of 69 
And I woke up in the middle of the night in October, sat up in the bed, said, ah, I recorded with Miles Davis. It took me that long to really register the fact that I had recorded with Miles and it was documented and it was going to be in the history of the world. That was always going to be a documentation. Someone would always be able to reference the fact that I had played with Miles Davis. So it was really, really special for me. Yeah. And like I said, not just with Miles, but on such a, uh, a touchstone piece of work. You yeah, know? It, you know, I teach a lecture class at NYU on the very album, Bitches Brew. I've been teaching it now for four semesters. <laughs> wow. It, it's that deep. You can go way into it, right? So, Yes, very much so. I mean, I never would have thought that I'd be teaching a class on an event that I had a, a part of. That's it's mind boggling to even think about that, you know. So what happened uh, in the aftermath of that for you? I mean, were you just all of a sudden in a lot more demand or, you know, what was the uh, outgrowth of having been part of that? Well, I can't, you know, the fact is, I guess I had gotten some street cred because of that. And I got to play with Freddie Hubbard mm -hmm. and recorded Red Clay. Now, the, the fact is, Miles wanted Tony Williams to play on Bitches Brew, but they had a falling out. And he suggested me. Freddie Hubbard had asked Tony Williams to play on Red Clay, but because Miles was upset that his rhythm section was making all these records with everybody else, they decided, Ron, Tony, and Herbie decided that they were not going to do records together anymore for other people. So Tony recommended me for Red Clay also. So I, I, you know, I, what can I say, man? You know, like <laughs> Tony Williams recommended me, you know, it's like really, really special, you know. And then Miles, I played a gig one night um, with Dave Liebman and, and uh, Steve Grossman, George Cables, uh, Calvin Hill played bass, and it was me and Bobby Moses playing drums. And Miles came to the gig in between sets in the back. He came over to me and he said, do you want to play with Jimi Hendrix? And I'm in awe of Miles. I said, nah. And I regret that to this, <laughs> point, to this day. You know. Wow, just to like do a jam session, you mean, or, or play on a yeah, record? Yeah, I, I think that Jimmy was looking for new musicians to do something new. And like, you know, he had uh, wanted to do some more progressive things, you know. Would that have been before uh, Buddy Miles hooked up with him? No, this, was a, this was after. This was this is right before he died. Okay. You know, you know what you know what was interesting is that like as as I said, um John Bonham was one of my guys that I listened to coming up with because Led Zeppelin, I really liked Led Zeppelin. And I'm in a store probably now it's been uh I don't know, twenty five years ago in LA the professional percussion shop. And this is after we turned it forever, after all the other things that I had done. And there's a book that was on the counter. And it was John Bonham giving interviews and talking about all of the tracks that he had done with Led Zeppelin. Now, Black Dog was my favorite track. And I loved it. And then, but as I got more into Led Zeppelin, uh, In My Time of Dying became my track. So I opened to the page where he talks about recording that session. And in that he says, we had been listening to more progressive music by now. And I had been listening to Tony Williams, Lenny White and Alphonse Mouzon. 
So you never know, man. You never know how these things work out, you know? Very cool. <laughs> right, right? Yeah, wow. Um, so you followed in Tony Williams' footsteps to a great degree in your early years. But what about in your sound and style, Lenny? Did you try to emulate at all what he was doing behind the kit? Or did you really make sure that you had your own style? You know, how did you cultivate Lenny White's sound and style? Well, here's, here's a really important point. At that time, that 1969, um, when Bitches Brew was made, Lifetime, Tony Williams' Lifetime also came out in 69. Now, Tony Williams had been influencing all young drummers. I mean, he took the classic organ trio, jazz organ trio, and put it on steroids. And so like Lifetime was like mind boggling It was totally another world for us. So anything that was electric, that was the point of reference as a drummer that you used at that particular time. So, you know, in me trying to sound like Tony Williams, I found my own style. And that's what a lot of young musicians have to be able to realize. They'll say, well, I mean, they, they have heroes and they say, well, I don't want to sound like him. I want to sound like myself. But if you use your hero as your point of reference and you try to play like, you're never going to play like somebody else. But what you're going to find out is how much when you try to play like somebody else, you sound like yourself. There's things that you do that you're trying to emulate this guy, but they became your own personal way of doing that. So that's how it was for me. I wanted to be like Tony Williams, but my drum sound, I wanted to be the Elvin Jones of jazz fusion. Well, we did, we call it jazz rock. I mean, when it was being created, it was called jazz rock because nobody had heard rock and roll played like that. Nobody had heard jazz played like that, but there were the two mediums that were kind of smashed together. And so it became jazz rock and then later on fusion. So I wanted it to sound like, I wanted my toms to sound like Thor. And, you know, I wanted it to be funky too. So I got my own way of doing it. Yeah, so it sounds like it was a pretty organic process for you. Everything that that uh, uh, becomes something later on was is an organic process. It's like kombucha, you know. Um, so, what were the uh, events that led you to being becoming part of Return to Forever? Well, I had done uh, the Miles record. And I had done the record with Freddie Hubbard. And then I worked with Joe Henderson for a long time. Uh, Joe Henderson had started a band after Red Clay and the band was George Cables, uh, Reggie Johnson played bass and Woody Shaw was playing trumpet and myself and Actually, Reggie Johnston decided to go to L.A. and do studio work. So we needed a bass player. And one night I went to Slugs in uh, New York. And Horace Silver was playing. And there was a young bass player playing with Horace Silver that, like, I was like, whoa, this guy's really badass. He's killing. And I went over to him and I, you know, introduced myself and I said, here is Joe Henderson's number. Give him a call. He needs a bass player. And that bass player was Stanley Clark. So Stanley Clark, George Cables, and I were Joe Henderson's rhythm section for quite a bit. And then George Cables and I left and became part of Freddie Hubbard's rhythm section with Alex Blake. 
and Stanley stayed, and Chick Corea came and played with Joe Henderson. So while I'm playing with uh, Freddie Hubbard, they get together with Ayerto and Flora and Joe Farrell, and they start Return to Forever. And at that time, they had made a record, and you know they were in Japan touring. I had left Freddie Hubbard and Pete and Coke Escovito called me and asked me to be a part of a band called Azteca, which was in the Bay Area. And that band had Paul Jackson playing bass, had Tom Harrell playing uh, trumpet, Mel Martin on saxophone, Neil Sean played some guitar. And uh, it was a very interesting band. It was, a, it was a, a big band that was a cross between Blood, Sweat and Tears and Santana. It was great. And so while I'm out on the West Coast between gigs with Azteca, Chick calls me from Japan and says, listen, Stanley and I are coming to San Francisco. We're going to play at the Keystone Corner. And Ayato and Flora are not going to be in the band anymore. We want to know if you just want to do a trio with us. And I said, yeah, great. I had played with both of these guys before. I played with Chick on the Bitches Brew Sessions. And I had played with Stanley with Joe Henderson's band. So they came to San Francisco. We played a week at the Keystone Corner in San Francisco. And it was some remarkable music. It was absolutely great. On the like, last night. like 1974, thereabouts? This is uh, 73. Yeah, 73. On the last night, Mingo Lewis, who I knew from Santana, came and sat in, played percussion. And two Bay Area guitarists sat in, Barry Finnerty and Bill Connors. And we played, we kind of jammed that night. And when it was over, I mean, it was great. When it was over, Chick said, listen, I want to start an electric return to forever. Would you do it? And I said, no, Chick, I'm going to stay here and be a big rock star with <laughs> Azteca. <laughs> so I stayed, <clears throat> excuse me, and they went back to New York and they got Steve Gadd to play. And while I was in San Francisco, you know, now still waiting for gigs with Azteca, a manager, Herbie Herbert, came to me and said, hey, listen, man, um, Ross Valerie and Neil Sean want to jam with you. Would you be into doing that? I said, sure. So we went to a jam session and we played and it was pretty, it was great. And Greg Raleigh, who also was in Santana, they decided to go, they were going to start this new band. And they said, they asked me, would you like to be the drummer in this new band that we're starting? And by this time, Chick had called me again and said, hey, man, come on back. I mean, Gad is going to do studio work and we really need you to be in this band. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll come back. So I left, I was going to leave Azteca and go back and play with Return to Forever. And the band that they wanted me to be in with Neil and Ross was Journey. I decided not to do Journey and go back and do Return to Forever. So that's how I got into Return to Forever. Well, that's, you know, kind of a win-win right there. You could have gone either way. Yeah, it was kind of cool. It was kind of cool. It was great. It was great. So how did the um, the sound of Return to Forever come together? Because you know, obviously it was such an influential group, and you guys were kind of, um, you know, pioneering that, you know, jazz rock that became known as fusion. You know, how did you guys coalesce all that? Well, it was part of the climate. 
you gotta understand, like if you think think about it, like the seminal jazz rock bands, Return to Forever, Martha Fish New Orchestra, um, Lifetime, um, Weather Report, and the Headhunters. All of those bands, there was at least one person, one, possibly two people that played on Bitches Brew. So it was the climate that was going on. And, you know, Mark Vishnu had come on the scene and like blew everybody away. It was like, whoa. Chick wanted to do something like Mark Vishnu. So when Return to Forever started to do what we did, the whole point was, see, the original Return to Forever was more of a samba band. But now things started to open up and they wanted me to play more rock-oriented beats. They didn't want me to improvise. They wanted me to lay the beats down and they wanted to improvise all on top of me. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be, I'm, I'm coming from a jazz background. I want to improvise just like they want to improvise. So this is what kind of the rub of them wanting me to just play beats and me not wanting to do that kind of, you know, morphed into this thing where we were a jazz rhythm section playing our version of rock and roll rather than just me playing straight beats. And, you know, with Chick, I mean, Chick is a master composer. And with, with Chick's music, we kind of morphed into this thing that was our way of playing jazz rock. It's interesting to hear you say that, Lenny, about the, the beat and the timekeeping, because I recently had Mike Clark on, and he actually was uh, frustrated quite a bit about being in the Headhunters and just keeping that steady beat so much. And, you know, when he could do something like actual proof, that was, you know, fantastic for him because he wanted to really do the jazz thing. Well, you know, there's, you, you know, Mike and I are writing a book, right? Did he tell you that? I did not know that. Yeah, Mike and I are actually writing a book. Okay. And in the book, we talk about this. See, uh, no, okay, so here's some history. I met Mike Clark in San Francisco because I spent time in San Francisco playing with Azteca. So the guys that I, I would hang out with in San Francisco, Gregorico, Mike Shreve, Mike Clark, you know, and David Garibaldi. Greg's also been on the show. Now, what messed me up is the fact that like they had this Oakland thing, this is what they did with 16th notes and displacing the backbeat. Me coming from the East Coast, I, I hadn't heard that. I was like, wow, man, that's really some slick stuff. So I kind of incorporated that in what it is that I did too. But, you know, those guys were doing that. So now <laughs> it's really weird how this all hooks together because this is really slick. Return to Forever is playing at the boarding house in San Francisco. And after one of the sessions, because I knew Mike Shreve and, and Carlos, there was a, a place in San Francisco called Coast Recorders where they used to record all of their records. So I got together a late night session after our gig at the boarding house. And it was Herbie Hancock, Doug Rausch, bass player, Billy Connors, Greg Arrico, and myself, two drummers. And so we played, and it was a real nice tape. I mean, I, I don't know what happened to it, but it's a new, real nice jam. So after that, Herbie calls me and says, hey, man, listen, I'm looking for a drummer. I got uh, um, Paul Jackson playing bass in this band. I said, 
Paul Jackson. So if you got Paul Jackson, you got to get Mike Clark. Paul Jackson and Mike Clark are like, you know, Stan and Ollie. And he said, Mike Clark. Okay. So, I can so Mike says that he had been talking to Herbie for six months about certain things. And Herbie didn't realize that Mike is the guy that he's been talking to about all this. So that hooks up. Mike and Paul Jackson, who have been playing together for years, now are in Headhunters. So I am now doing my Return to Forever stuff, and I wanted to get a bigger drum sound. I had this blonde Gretsch kit. And so I go to Leo's in Oakland with my Clark to buy a Fibes drum kit. And I sell my blonde drum kit to Mike Clark, which Mike Clark now in Headhunters is using this kit. He goes to record the Thrust record and the producer, David Rubinson, wants to tape all of the drums up because that's the sound, the tape, the drums up. And Mike doesn't want that. He's totally frustrated about having to tape the drums up. So he says that this is all in the book. He says that he goes and he chants. And he chants not to just play, but he wants to make something memorable. So he does this beat. Now, basically, when guys hear that, they think that Mike is playing this really funk thing in it. But Mike wants to play straight ahead. That's his version of playing straight ahead time. But how he displaces the beat and all that is so slick. Plus, he didn't play a whole lot of tom-toms on there because they were all taped up. So that's how he, how he came up with this beat. And it's classic. It's, it's amazing. Hmm. But that's that history. Here it is that Mike and I know each other. I sell him my drum set. That's the drum set that he uses on actual proof. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of crazy, you know. It's all that six degrees of separation stuff, man. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> wow. So... During that time, though, uh, Letty, you know, when all these great fusion groups were happening, how much were you um, listening to what the other guys were doing? And how much was that influencing what you did? Oh, all the time. I mean, you know, the Alfonso was on, uh, um, Eric Cravat. Um, Cobham? Say it again. Oh, of course. Yeah. You know, I mean, the fact is there was this – I don't know. Uh, there was this fraternity that, uh, <laughs> the, you know, the best way that I could describe it, and it sounds weird, but this it was like when you got seven or eight candidates going for president, and there's the Democratic Party, and there's the GOP. The fact is, is that we were all, everybody wanted to show each other how great they were. And this really made you be on your toes all the time. You know, some of the greatest music that was played is because we're on a show with Re Weather Report. And, you know, we want to represent, they want to represent, so like this is great music going on. And that's the way it was. I mean, we, we all listened to everybody. If anybody told you that they didn't do that, they were lying. But we were not just listening to each other. We were listening. The rock guys were listening to us. We were listening to the rock guys. It was like, that was a great time period, man. <clears throat> and the music reflects it. I mean, some, sometimes I think some of that uh, music was squashed because it was too much to handle. I mean, and they couldn't market it to a certain way, but <clears throat> there's some great music that was made 
and that was because the climate was such a fertile climate in terms of <clears throat> excuse me making stuff happen. Miles Davis was still alive. Everybody wanted to impress Miles Davis, you know. Everybody wanted to, all the drummers wanted to impress Tony Williams. And then they, some got, not me, but some got to the point where like, oh yeah, well, that was Tony, man. Now this is me, I'm, you know. No, but the fact of the matter is, man, it was a great time period because the music was king and we wanted to represent the music and it, and you had to be hip. You couldn't be corny. You had that cross pollination going on. Exactly. And exactly. it was appropriately fruitful. I mean, it, it, it was cross pollinized so much it became fusion. So, Return to Forever and some of the other acts back then, I mean, drew tremendous fan bases, you know, and sold a lot of records. But at the time, as I recall, for the most part, critics were not very kind, you know, and then over time, it seems like. Maybe the critics caught up a little bit to what you guys were doing and some of the other fusion groups were doing, but especially all these jazz purists, you know, they were like very hard on the fusion movement. So, you know, you take that with a grain of salt or, you know, how do you feel about that? Now we do, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think that, you know, the issue is, Artists create art. I think one of the problems today is with this, the concept that everything is supposed to be equal and everything is supposed to be fair. Art is not fair. What we did was counterculture. And things that were counterculture moved the culture forward. You know, now there's this uh, um, idea of inclusion and uh, things should be fair and everybody should have the same opportunity for it. That necessarily isn't the case. That's not what it should be with art. I think that people have a hard time with change. And what we were doing was changing. We were changing how people viewed what certain genres of music were. We were smashing the genres. We were tearing down walls. And so anybody that does that, you know, you're going to have to get some gaff with that. And what was cool is that we all had a fraternity and we, we were cool with it because it was just not one person. It was not just one band. Everybody was doing it and we were changing the way people were listening to music. So nowadays when people want to say, well, yes, I'll listen to that music and I'll listen to that music and well, I don't listen to that music anymore. I think it's the attitude. I think when people say, well, he's not a new sounding musician. Or I think those things have to do with attitude. Jazz music has always been an evolving music. It will always evolve because of what the culture is behind it. It is improvisation. Improvisation always changes. That's what it is. That's what you do. So if you're fortunate enough to have an audience and the audience follows you, that's great. But you have to move and the audience that you have has to move with you. And back then, when we were doing what we were doing, it was okay for that to happen. And then it got to a point where, no, that was not okay anymore. Well, you, you, you lost the tradition, so we have to get back to tradition. 
And we never lost a tradition. Never at once. We played what we played and what we played was a morphing of the tradition. So that's what I say about that. 